All yours, John. All right. Uh, can you guys see the cursor over the screen? Yes, we. Yes. I can. Excellent. Okay. Well, I'm going to talk about the Devonian period. Uh, I started this uh, this PowerPoint when uh, Kathy was working in the uh, uh, junior high of Downs Grove area, and they had a, a project with um, Cornell University and P and PRI uh, to work on some Devonian uh, shale from New York and do the uh, a, 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 a fossil count. So um, they asked if, if someone could, you know, do a, a, a program for the kids on the Devonian to tell them what was actually going on at that time. And, and that's what I did. Obviously, I've updated it quite a bit. Uh, normally, as you know, I, I work in Ordovician, but believe me, the Devonian is an incredibly interesting period. And it is going to be uh, the theme for the next, uh, for this year's uh, expo. It's going to be Devonian 2. So if you have any papers you want to put in that, uh, our, our volume um, on the Devonian, uh, uh, let me or Chris uh, Cozart know, uh, and we can, uh, we can get you in on that. Um, the Devonian is important for two really important bio events, and that is the appearance of ammonoids and tetrapods. And we're going to go through that uh, as part of the, the program. And of course, Lots of pictures of fossils. Now, uh, here's the Devonian. You can see it here. There, there is the Ordovician, yay, and the Devonian uh, expanded here. Uh, here's a couple of things we'll be talking about uh, uh, the Tegan, uh, Teganic event. Uh, and these are the two extinction events, Kelwasser and Engenberg. Obviously, they're named after. Uh, uh, are words in 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 German? They're they're they're, they're German shales, uh, but dark shales that um, indicate an, uh, an extinction. We'll talk about that. But but this is the um, the Devonian and its uh, stages. Um, Elfian Javedian is uh, is an important one for the area. Franian Femenian. Um, is uh, also important, uh, especially in Iowa. Uh, a little bit about the Devonian period. Uh, 416 to 359 million years ago. Uh, yes, I didn't mention that, but another incredible bio event is the first forests and including uh, the first uh, coals that apparently can be mined, uh, which is a, a neat thing too. Animal evolution is an overdrive, particularly Obviously important to us is the lungfish to lobefin fish to tetrapods to maybe an amphibian. The jury is still out after literally decades that we may or may not have an amphibian in the uh, Devonian. That really isn't a big deal because as soon as you get to the lower Carboniferous, amphibians appear, as, as, as I'll show you. Uh, coral reefs dominate the communities, obviously. Uh, Devonian is known for its uh, coral reefs, especially uh, the ones that you see in Iowa. Uh, it's the most extensive reef, develop, reef development in Earth history. Of course, those coral reefs went belly up in one of the in the Devonian um, last uh, Devonian extinction, and the Mississippian started out with no corals uh, as uh, as anchors for the animals, and they went into these mud mound things that, uh, that they they talk about. Uh, fish are the dominant animal group. Uh, here is a picture from, I can't remember if this is the uh, uh, Conklin Quarry or the Klein Quarry in Iowa, but this is, to show you the density, this is a just a chunk of rock that got blown off, and all of these are corals, you, as you can see, uh, on, on this uh, piece of rock. It's really neat. I didn't bring the rock home. Uh, here's what the um, Laurentia, the North America, essentially looked like uh, during the uh, uh, during the early Devonian. Uh, the Raic Ocean, Iapetus, the Iapetus Ocean is going to get uh, smushed by Avalonia over here, and a few other things in the Raic Ocean is going to uh, take over eventually. Uh, the big the big origin was kind of a continuation. Um, 
of the Taconic from, uh, uh, from the uh, Ordovician is the Acadian origin. Subduction continues on the eastern margin, margin of Laurentia. Uh, there's an active late, late Silurian through late Devonian. Uh, Baltica collides with Laurentia in the north, and Avalonia Carolina collides with Laurentia on the south. Poor Laurentia. Uh, deformation of earlier Taconic rocks that were laid down during the Ordovician. Uh, erosion results in one of the most famous um, stratigraphic features, and that's a Catskill clastic wedge uh, seen over in uh, the east, particularly upstate New York. You're going to see some stuff I'm going to show you from upstate New York. If you've never been to upstate New York, it's another world. Uh, it's, it's really neat to see, uh, centered around uh, Cornell University and PRI. Uh, in Ithaca, New York, uh, but you'll see some pictures of that in a, in a bit. Uh, forms a bedrock in central New York. Yay! Can be seen in the gorges of the Finger Lakes region, particularly around, as I said, uh, uh, Ithaca, New York. Uh, in fact, they have a saying in Ithaca. Are you ready for this? Ithaca is gorges. I hear you all laughing. Mm -hmm. Here is uh, the geologic setting after the Taconic origin and just before the Acadian. Here's everything lining up to slam into uh, Laurentia. Boom, more volcanoes and stuff. And this is the um, Proto-Atlantic, but actually it's the Iapetus Ocean and it is replaced by the Rayic Ocean. And here's the late Demonian. Uh, you can see now that the Rake Ocean is taken over. We have the Acadian Highlands uh, right here in Gondwana is fairly close to Laurentia. Now, here is a gorge cut into the Upper Devonian Clastics, forming a hanging valley at Taganic Falls, north of Ithaca, New York. This is an easy walk, one mile in. Now, this we're we're looking at a different uh, location for this. Uh, for the Taganic Falls, it's up higher, so I'm taking a picture down, and you can see the uh, um, the falls there. This is when there wasn't as much water. In fact, I've seen them dried up. Uh, uh, I used to go visit uh, my daughter. Kathy and I uh, did, too, uh, in Ithaca when she was at college there, and uh, there was one time that, Ke that Chris and I walked up the uh, gorge. There was no water at all, and we actually walked up uh, the gorge itself. Uh, saw a little baby river otter too, which is kind of cool. Now, believe it or not, here's a closer up view with more water. These are the highest falls east of the Mississippi. Yes, higher than Niagara Falls. They're somewhere in the neighborhood of 215 feet high um, that you can see here now, obviously not as extensive, uh, here is the, uh, this is the, where you can see the, the global Taganic onlap uh, at Taganic Falls. Uh, and here are the units that you can see here. This is a different photograph I took from the side. So it's essentially with a different lighting. So you can see the different units. Uh, Geneseo is a, is a famous name of the shale. Uh, so is the uh, Renwick shale up here too. But it's kind of neat. And like I said, a trip to upstate New York you will never be disappointed. It's really, really neat. Uh, the Devonian climate, fairly uniform, uh, warm, dry conditions. Uh, continental interiors are arid, which was the start of the idea that these low fin fish like Eustonoptera, and I'll show you that, uh, because it was arid, the, the pools are drying up and they would walk or, or crawl with their fins to different to, to larger ponds and, and that, that made their lake stronger. Well, we found out that that's not true, as I'll show you. But that was the reason that they started that, that story. Uh, late Devonian fluctuations, regressive transgressive cycles, which brings in this uh, the onlaps and the offlaps of the sediments. Uh, greenhouse and ice house cycles. Uh, southern glaciation at the end of the period 
and then it goes into the uh, into the Mississippian period. And then there's another one at the, I think, end of the Pennsylvania. Well, not, they're not periods, they're epochs, um, the Pennsylvania epoch. Uh, Devonian plant evolution, adaption, adaptations. Uh, to conserve one, and now remember, Silurian plants are were just small little things. You wouldn't even, you would slip on them if you were walking on them because they're just really small. Uh, to conserve water, they had to develop bark and cuticles. Upright stance, woody tissue did that. Well, they needed to be upright so that they could capture uh, the, uh, the sunlight. Uh, but they also have to deal with uh, UV, which happened uh, with, with forming a cuticle and with two specialized enzymes that resisted UV light. Uh, they obtained water, gases, nutrients, roots, leaves, and stomata. Uh, was the gas where the gas exchange took place? Uh, roots, for more, you know, obviously roots are an anchor, but mostly they're to get bring the uh, nutrients up. Uh, early Devonian plants are relatively small, just like the uh, the uh, Silurian ones, uh, and and low growing, confined to boggy ecosystems. However, in the late Devonian, these things, these these early trees grew to great size, 10 to 40 meters. Uh, and there's a place in, I think it's Bal Balboa or no, Galbo or something like that in New York where they have roots of these things, of these huge trees uh, exposed in quarries. They're really, really something. Woody tissues supported the trees and formed the first forest and eventually formed coals that have been mined. So those are the first coals are in the late, late Devonian. Here are the uh, early plants, similar to Stillerian ones, although a little bit more advanced. And then here's what you had in the late Devonian. Yeah, this Gilboa. Gilboa, New York is where you have them. And you can see these enormous root systems that they had there, uh, huge trees, um, and these and these became the first uh, coals. Really, kind of neat. Uh, significance of plants. Well, they began to form soils, and that's what that's what plants do. Uh, in fact, I had a a graduate course in uh, soil science, and what plants do is cycle cycle uh, nutrients, um, and that's what they do when they they form the soils. And then they cycle the nutrients back and forth. Uh, that's why um, the grassy areas in the, in the middle of the uh, United States are so rich is because the grasses use an enormous number of nutrients and return those to the soils. And that's why uh, tropical soils are so poor, because all the nutrients are being cycled and uh, are, are essentially eroded away or taken back up when a tree or a plant dies. Uh, so it's surprising you go to, you look at the tropical rainforest and you say, wow, look at all the plants. It's probably the poorest soil or one of the poorest soils in the world. Uh, root stabilized soils and reduced erosion, continued oxygenation, continue the oxygenation of the atmosphere. A byproduct of tree is forming uh, oxygen. Yay. Eventually provided food for animals, but that, Animals came on land prior to plants. And there was animals. We have uh, uh, examples of uh, tracks of animals in the Ordovician on land. They would come up and then obviously go back to the water, but uh, but they were on land. Um, uh, the food for animals occurred after animals were established. The first land animals were probably carnivores. Now, Devonian animals. Uh, as I said before, there's massive coral reefs, which became the centers for all of these, uh, um, uh, for all of the animals. Invertebrates, corals, trilobites, which makes some people, I know at least one person in our little group, very happy with these Devonian trilobites. Brachypods, insects, and the first ammonoids. And here's a restoration of a Devonian reef, which is kind of neat. They put in some elaborate trilobites and one poor small little 
nautiloid in here and a, and a fishy, but believe me, the nautiloids, some of them got a lot bigger than this, as you'll see. Uh, here are some Devonian invertebrate animals. Um, you know, two corals. These I got from, um, I can't remember. I think one of them is from Indiana and the other I think is from, uh, is from Iowa. Uh, some of the quarries have a residual soil in Iowa. Um, and they have some incredible corals on there. Here's one that I got from there. Prismatophyllum, that's a gorgeous coral. Uh, this one, I think, is, is also from Iowa, a uh, hexagon area. Uh, also from Iowa, Favocytes. They, they come out in, in a residual soil. They, they often come out without any uh, matrix or anything on them. They're just the fossil itself. Uh, Platy Raquella Iowa ensis, probably could tell you where that's from. Uh, what else? There's a couple of the brachiopods. Um, Atripa is a very common brachiopod. I'm guessing our, our keynote speaker for Expo this year is Jed Day, and he is a literally a world expert on brachiopods. Um, it's amazing. I've seen him talk several times, uh, both in, in uh, 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 amateur settings and in professional and this guy knows brachiopods like nobody else does. And here's one of the uh, nautiloids, uh, Tetranodoceros, uh, that I got in Iowa at, uh, um, at the Independence Quarry. Now, this is there's two kinds of these, one in which these oils in the middle touch and one in which they don't. Fortunately, I got one where they touch. So I decided when I was reconstructing this, to leave this part, and you can see there's a gap here, to leave this part free so that I can show where the two met. You can see the siphuncle uh, and the little guy, uh, tetranodosterous, because it's got four nodes around as you go uh, back around. Uh, and the, I, was, I, I was really fortunate to be able to do that uh, and keep it uh, so I can take it apart. Uh, here's another one I got uh, at um, the, the the lake in the big Iowa lake. Uh, there's a, a on the shoreline you can get some uh, some nice fossils. This is uh, one of the um, um, guys that floated uh, filtering. Here's a coiled one, Nephritocerus. This is not a nautiloid. This is a gastropod. They had some huge gastropods in the Devonian. I got this in the same place. I got that one nautiloid along the lake. Uh, um, uh, and this is, the, I, I looked at it and I said, well, this is, and uh, I don't know if it was, uh, if it was Marv or, or uh, Jim that said, oh, that's, that's a gastropod. Look at it closely. And it is. This is a very rare one. This is Taxocrinus from the Devonian up in uh, or Milwaukee at one time. Had a, had a small section of exposed Devonian. It's long gone. And this is one of the fossils that came from there. I traded for this guy with beauty. Uh, here are some blastoids, Devonian blastoids, way before Entremites was invented. These are from down, uh, down in Indiana, Kentucky area. You can also get them up on the uh, shoreline of Lake, uh, the big lake, Superior, I guess. Or here on one of the two. Here is a uh, from a, a, a trip, an Iowa uh, Geologic uh, Society uh, field trip uh, that I was on, and this is a section of rock with a whole bunch of Idra asteroids on, as you can see. And here's a close-up one of them. Uh, several of us found uh, chunks of rock that had these Idrios on. Really nice, nice looking specimens. Uh, here is a trial that I got up in Canada. Um, we were looking for uh, aminoids and straight nautiloids, and there were lots of them. And this is the one uh, trilobite that I saw, and it, it's perfect. It's it's enrolled. It's per but as you can see, it's quite small. Uh, now, 
aminoids and the origin of them. There is an intermediate group called Bactrotids. And they're not quite sure what to do with this little guy. Uh, some say it's a subclass or some give it as a suborder of Aminoidea. In fact, uh, sometimes they're called straight Aminoids. Uh, they evolved through the nautiloids of the orthocerid type. That, well, okay, sometimes referred to as straight aminoid J. Uh, morphological features. They have a ventral siphuncle and a ventral septal furrow. I'll show you that in a minute. They have an incredibly long body chamber. It just for the size of them, they're longer than pretty much any uh, cephalopod. And they are speculated to be the intermediates or ancestor to aminoids, belemnoids, and coleoids. Belemnoids are kind of like shelled coleoids, sort of. They've got a phragma cone like, like nautiloids, but they've got a rostrum. That, and that's what most people find uh, as uh, fossils of the belemnoids. Here is. Bactrites subconicus from the early Devonian of Germany. Uh, and here is from Argentina that shows the septal furrows and the incredibly long living chamber. That's amazing. Now, here's a little cautionary note. At one time, and I've got a picture of it, but I, I, I didn't uh, put it in. At one time, they said, well, I think maybe the Bactrids or Bactrides uh, evolved in the Ordovician. Uh, no, I don't think so. What about the Silurian? Somebody found one. And they decided that it wasn't prepared enough. And they started to prepare it. And when they did, I don't know if they used water or what they used, it simply disintegrated. It no longer exists. So, so you know, Evidence suggests that at the end of the Silurian, these guys started, but uh, we lost our evidence. So over-preparing, mm, got to be careful. Uh, now, here's the evolution of Paleozoic aminoids, and then we'll uh, talk more about the two uh, bottlenecks later on, and I've got them marked here. Um, here are the Devonian nautiloids, the eight goniotites. We're all familiar with the goniotites, all familiar with those. And they did start also in the Devonian and went all the way through the Permian. This is a original group. And obviously you can see led to the uh, goniotites. They didn't last past the late Devonian. Here's a weird group of, clim uh, of, of aminoids called Climenia. And I'll show you why they're weird in just a minute. Uh, and then in the Mississippian, this group, the uh, Prolocanatida, uh, developed, and they are the rootstock of the other, of the post Paleozoic aminoids. Here's the ceratites. And then up here, where you can't see it, obviously, is where the true ammonites developed in the Jurassic. And here are the two bottlenecks. You can see in the spindle diagram, here's what happened to the um, aminoids during the uh, first extinction. And then the second one here, we'll talk more about that later. And here are some of this Goniotides. Now, this one, on, on uh, one of these I got at Expo, this one here. And here's one that Russo Flower gave me. He, he, he did a lot of work in New York and he gave me this one. And he said, this is one of the first uh, uh, aminoids, which is kind of cool. Here's one I found up in uh, the Iowa, the same quarry that they had Tornodoceros, and this is Tornodoceros Iwaense. Really kind of cute. Now, restorations. What they're finally doing is showing aminoids with 10 arms. Um, and when I go through my um, cephalopod uh, uh, PowerPoint, I, I, I show how uh, there's two groups of nautiloids that developed. Uh, Nautilus-like uh, tentacles, and then coleoid-like arms. And here shows 10 arms. The, the hood or operculum is actually 
more speculative than the arms are, uh, but early aminoids may have had a percolums like like Nautilus or, or, or hoods like Nautilus. Um, vertebrates, all groups of fish were represented. Ostracoderms, acanthodians, acoderms, lobe fin fish, cartilaginous fish, bone, everything, everything. And the fish eventually evolved, in, as we're going to see, into tetrapods. Now, here's a new restoration, in, and I just put this out here because it really looks like this guy's always, it's just a mean, mean animal. Uh, this is Dunkleosteus, the dominant Devonian marine predator. I mean, it, it, it and it's big. It's, these are, I think, uh, these occur like, they're like 30 feet long or something, and and uh, these aren't actually teeth. These are just part of the skull. <laughs> and it just clumped down and pretty much killed everything. Kind of neat. Um, most significant result in the Devonian bife. I know aminoids are cool, but I mean, let's face it, tetrapods led to us. So these are kind of important. Uh, the lungs evolved to gulp air. Uh, lobe fin fish develop bones in the fins, articulated bones. We see them in Eustinopteron, I'll show you. Uh, I allowed them to hold up their body. Fins gradually changed to limbs where they became tetrapods. Early tetrapods had more than five digits. I'll show you that also. Uh, first true amphibian, eh, probably not until the early Carboniferous. Uh, Pederpes uh, was the first true land walker with five digits. It is still questionable whether any of the Devonian tetrapods actually was more adept at land than the water, and probably not. But uh, again, our ideas are changing. Uh, here's and this is what we're going to talk about. Here's venturing onto land. Here's a traditional view. I told my kids this when I first taught. And I showed them the, the film This Land, um, which was a superior at that time a superb uh, view of the. Um, uh, of the geologic history of North America. Uh, here's the traditional view that I used to tell the kids. Arid climates, pools began to dry out. Lobe fin fish like Eustinopteron pulled themselves to bigger pools. Evolution favored the strongest limbs and lungs. Uh, the rest would just dry out. You know, they'd just be carrying. Uh, here's now our new view. The limbs were used to navigate streams and lake bottoms uh, in forested areas where the roots were actually in the water and these fish tetrapods would have to negotiate uh, the uh, the water in there. Uh, limbs were used to hold head above water to gulp air. That's how they got stronger. Uh, they were later co-opted for use on land, but not directly for use on land. They were used to, again, that's why the petrol um, uh, fins developed uh, earlier uh, than the pelvic ones. Uh, high limb limbs, although, eventually became the most important, as we know. Here is the cladogram of tetrapod evolution. Here's my favorite fishy, Eustinopteron, that led to Pandurthes. Now, I think we've all heard of Tiktaalik. Uh, because um, uh, the University of Chicago worked on uh, uh, getting these and, and, and working on them. Uh, then we had a set of early tetrapods. Uh, here's Ventastega, one of the uh, early, more important ones. Notice we're right up at the Devonian Carboniferous boundary. Here's a red hill jaw that was found in Pennsylvania. Uh, Acanthostega, Ichthyostega, Telerpeton, and then finally up here in the Mississippi uh, is the uh, amphibian Pederpes. Now, here's a surprising thing. Probably since Tiktaalik and Ventastega, there really hasn't been any new um, discoveries of tetrapods. Acanthostega and Ichthyostega are still considered the, the 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 types of developing um tetrapods. Telerpeton is is one also. 
it is kind of a newer one, but uh, um, very limited fossil evidence on this guy. Fortunately, it was the right kind of fossil evidence. Now, here's a cladogram of tetrapod evolution with the skulls. Uh, we don't have a skull for Telerpaton. Uh, we have just the front and back legs with the, with the digits, which is really, that's really the most, probably one of the most important parts, which is kind of neat. Uh, Canthostega, Ichthyostega, uh, chubby little guy here. And here are the limb digits. A uh, Canthostega had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight digits front and back legs. Ichthyostega, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I'm not sure what this is doing here. This is a, uh, this was thought to be uh, a digit, but it's actually just some kind of a, I don't know, a prong or something. Uh, and if, if memory serves, we only have the front feet of Ichthyostega, not the uh, the hind feet. But they're assuming that there's seven. Here's Telerpaton. Notice there's only six. And we do have both front and hind digits for these guys. So we know that they had six on both uh, front and uh, hind legs. And his Pederpes uh, with the five, which won out. Why? Nobody knows why we have five and not six or eight or whatever. Uh, six looks kind of cool. We'd have probably developed tools faster if we had six digits, but I'm just speculating. But here you go. There's the digits. Uh, late Devonian tetrapod sites, uh, Pennsylvania. The most important one is probably East Greenland. Uh, right here. Now, remember, we're talking about this is the configuration for uh, the Devonian, so things look a little bit different. Uh, but East Greenland uh, is very important. Scotland is too. Um, and of course, Pennsylvania for uh, Red Hill and other sites. So there you go. That's where they're located. Notice, but except for a few outliers, they're all located right here real close to the equator, kind of neat. Now, let me show you some of the animals and restorations, which may or may not change through time. Here is the one that started it all, Eustinopteron. It has articulated pectoral limb bones. That was the first thing that they looked at. They looked at it and said, wait a minute, there's actually bones here that we can identify as wrist bones and stuff uh, of, of, of vertebrates. Of, of tetrapods and stuff. Um, apparently, we're, we're suggesting that Eustinopteron was able to gulp air. Here's Pandorichthys. Uh, pectoral fins more derived than pelvic. Again, presence of distal radials, digit homologs, right in here. Uh, Tetrapod-like middle ear architecture. Things are, you know, it takes time. And things are developing. Here is Tiktaalik. This is a, a restoration I hadn't seen previously, so I decided to, to show it. It's got a flat skull with dorsally uh, placed eyes. A primitive but flexible neck. In fact, apparently, uh, Tiktaalik was the first vertebrate with a neck that would actually articulate. Derived wrist bones and pectoral fins, again, uh, being the more, uh, the strongest ones, the ones used the most. Uh, here's, here's Elgin, Elginerpaton, and no, this is not our Elgin. This is an Elgin in, God, I think it's in Europe or or, or, or or Asia or someplace, but not ours, sorry. Earliest recognized tetrapod. Well, I don't know. Derived head morphology, as you can see, show, show, Shoulder girdle and pelvis resemble ichthyostega. Okay, but I consider ichthyostega is probably uh, one of the first. Here's ventostega, uh, skull intermediate between tectalic and acanthostega. Little postcranial material available for this guy right here, but they have the uh, limb bones and stuff. 
Here is the Canthostega. Now, I had a lot of different um, restorations of this guy, but I chose this one because this is the one that's most uh, accurate for our, our, our recent thinking about them. Uh, see, he's trying to get navigate this, this, this water with all these trees and limbs and stuff, and he's taking his limbs, his front limbs, and lifting his head up to gulp air. Um, Paddle-like backward directed hind limbs, as you can see. So basically, these are not designed for land. Uh, these are designed for um, uh, for uh, in the water. Eight digits on each foot, and it has a fish-like tail. Here's Dictyostega. And this one is uh, a restoration that shows uh, the little guy or the big guy crawling up on land. Uh, not sure. Trees are accurate, though. Yay. Hind limbs and tail like a Canthostega. Seven digits on the hind foot. We don't have. I thought it was the front foot we didn't have, but I guess it's the or, or, or had. But it's the uh, hind foot we have, the front we don't have. Uh, partially terrestrial? I don't know. Maybe. They, they picture it as still having uh, backward-facing uh, uh, pelvic uh, legs so, and, and um, a tail like a canthosega, so not sure if it could actually do what it's doing here. Uh, here's Telerpeton. Notice this is the only important part of, of, that they have of it, other than all of this, which, I mean, if you're going to have something for a tetrapod, this is what you want preserved. It has the the, the pelvis, or not, well, the pelvic um, uh, bones and the hind limbs and the pectoral uh, uh, group and bones and the front limbs. And you can see they both have six on it. So this is all we got of that guy. We don't, you know, we don't have much. It has front with, you know, with some teeth and stuff, but not much of that either. But again, this is really what you wanted to have. And, and bam, there you are. Uh, now, Devonian ammonoid extinction events. Yeah, the Kilwasser and the Hangenberg. Both of these, although one is more duality than the other, both of these are consist of, uh, especially the, I think especially the Kilwasser, of two very closely spaced uh, individual events that they put together uh, because of the shells are pretty much the same. And then here's the last one. Notice this is the Franian Fomenian boundary, which is the Kilwasser Kel, uh, event, and the Devonian Mississippian or uh, uh, Famian uh, Turinian, uh, Turizian, Turizian, something uh, boundary. Uh, late Devonian extinctions, the Franian, I guess that's how you say it, Franian. Yay. Fomenian boundary is a Kilwasser event. Uh, consists of two brief successive biodiversity crises, 95% global coral extinction. Other victims were trilobites and shallow warm water taxa. Ammonoids were severely affected. The Aegon Yatiatida go extinct. Bye bye. Speculated causes. Again, remember the causes of an extinction are. Are, are pretty involved. There, there, there's almost always more than one uh, cause uh, for these extinctions, but here's what they cite. Rapid regressive transgressive cycles. See, if they're too rapid, when they when they're regresses, the animals simply just, you know, are left to stand and they're, they're dying. If it transgresses too fast, they can't keep up with it and they get uh, killed that way too. So. Uh, there's a pronounced anoxic event, and that's what formed the dark shales of the Kilwasser event in Germany. Uh, there was a pronounced anoxic event. Those, those produced uh, black shales. Uh, general global cooling, reduced speciation rates, not elevated extinction rates. That's the thinking of a couple of uh, researchers that have been working on this, and they say, I'm not sure it's that much of an extinction as Reduce speciation rates. Well, uh, corals, no, that was that was definitely an extinction. Here's the late Devonian extinction part D, uh, the Hangenberg event. 
again, prolonged two-stage event. All placoderms and stromatopores go extinct. So you're losing, you're losing all of your reef building organisms. And like I said, for the, the early carboniferous, the Mississippian epoch, um, things had to change. And you can see that down in Kentucky with the um, with the mud mounds that they have exposed in some of the road cuts. Um, and uh, they were held together by echinoderms and um, and bryozoans, uh, but they, there were no corals were, or stromatopores at that time. Yeah. Uh, trial device and brachypods are again are decimated. Severe ammonoid bottleneck, that, that rare um, short lived ammonoid uh, order, the climenida, climenida uh, go extinct. Now, as I'll show in my, uh, uh, as I plan to show in um, the program for Expo, uh, these guys were weird because they had a siphuncal in the different spot. It was a dorsally located siphuncal when pretty much every other ammonoid that ever existed from the Devonian to the Cretaceous had a ventral uh, siphuncal. And why they did that, nobody knows. Uh, but they didn't last long. I actually uh, got one, at, uh, found one uh, in Expo. Uh, so I do have one of these guys here. It's kind of cool. Speculated causes again, dramatic sea level fluctuations for that before. Rapid transgression, spread of anoxic waters. That's not good. Followed by equally rapid regression. Southern hemisphere glacial, interglacial episodes induced by orbital forcing. We haven't talked about that, but we're finding out that a lot of extinctions, a lot of climate, uh, ice age especially, is controlled by Milankovitch cycles. They're named after a uh, Croatian scientist, Milutin Milankovic, trust me, that's actually his name, uh, who proposed that there were three types of orbital uh, uh, inconsistencies in the Earth. Um, one of them is the angle of the of the uh, of the axis. Our pole star changes. Another one is has to do with the uh, precession of the equinoxes. Uh, but the most important one has to do with the uh, eccentricity of our orbit. Our orbit changes from. You know, I mean, it's not it's not super elliptical, but it is elliptical to almost circular, uh, and that is uh, it's a hundred thousand year cycle, and that's the one that is believed to mainly cause um, uh, ice ages and stuff like that. Uh, that's why they think that's why that most of the interglacial periods were a hundred thousand years long, and we're just starting our interglacial. It's only. Uh, about 12,000 years old. So we've got a long way to go for the next ice age. Unless, uh... So a summary of the, or of the uh, Devonian. Organic evolution was in high gear. The first major forests appear. Tetrapods evolved from fish and rapidly diversified. Coral reefs dominate the communities. Most extensive reef development in Earth history. Cat skill classic wedge develops. Extinctions severely affect opening of the Carboniferous. Reforming corals virtually non-existent. Calcareous algae build small mounds and are held together uh, by echinoderms and uh, bryozoans. Uh, shallow water carbonate ramps develop. That's where a lot of the echinoderms uh, of, uh, formed also. And you can see that again down in Kentucky uh, there's a lot of uh, road cuts that show these um, uh, these ramps and the green shale where the uh, um, where the echinoderms are. Uh, ramps based for growth of buildups, mud mounds, and bioherms. There's a there's a name for it, a German name, and I can't think of what it is exactly now. But uh, there's a name, Walsorian Wal Wal mounds, I believe it's called Walsorian Wal mounds. Carbonate muds trapped by bryozoans and echinoderms. Enter the Carboniferous. Yay! 
Okay, now let me get show grid video. Okay, there we go. Hi guys. Um, we can take questions now. If you can hear me and I can hear you and stuff. So, anybody with any questions, re re recalling the fact that I'm much more adept at the Ordovician than the Devonian. So I have a question. Of course, I always okay. have questions. Um, at the last presentation in the general meeting, we learned a lot about the bones based on stress on the bones and everything else. So my question goes, falls along with that. Um, on the early tetrapods, do have they been studied based on the bones for stress to find out if they actually were used on, you know, for for land based or for the, you know, for maneuvering in the water? Because I would think that would be a very, very different um yeah. showing different stresses on the different bones. Yeah, they actually have uh I, I've read a lot of articles. Uh okay, don't don't spread this around. But I've got an awful art, a lot of articles on tetrapods and Devonian stuff, and um, none of them indicate that there's any um, stress-related fractures on the bones, or or very few, um, which is again is one of the things they 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 thought. Wait a minute, now what's going on here? Um, remember now, these animals aren't very big anyway, so right. the stress the stress on the bones are going to are going to be minimal, but but they they still say the elephant says wait a minute you know these are these are developing bones these are not as uh, uh, as as developed as, as our bones and stuff and uh, but no uh, so they're thinking you know these guys probably stayed mostly in the water so any of the any of the restorations you look at and, and it shows them you know traipsing on land um, maybe for a couple of minutes but. Uh, they're, they're they're not going to be able to negotiate in the Devonian anyway. They're not going to be able to negotiate land very well. Yeah. Then the other one that deals with the also yeah. the digits. Um, are there any newer studies that discuss whether they were webbed or actually fully developed digits? We, right. We don't know for well. They were they were developed digits. There's, there's no question yeah. about that. Now whether they were webbed or not. Uh, many uh, restorations do have it. Some don't. We're, we're not sure uh, because we don't have any uh, uh, carbon uh, type of, uh, you know, like you do for ichthyosaurus, where you see the outline of the body or anything. We, we don't have right. that. They just have the bones themselves. So uh, it would not be, it, I would not at all be surprised if at least the hind limbs which you know were were bent backwards like you saw in the in the restorations uh, and used for swimming. I would not be surprised at all if they were webbed. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It was it was to my understanding that they were unable to lift their bodies up from locomotion. It was more dragging their bodies when they're out of water. Am I correct on that? Yeah. Um, I, I, like I said, uh, the chances of a Devonian tetrapod getting out on land were, were very rare. Uh, they're going to they're going to stay mostly in the water and their 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 limbs are going to be strengthened by lifting their body. But remember they're in water, so they're lifting a um, a a somewhat supported body by the water as they gulp air. So it's a remember it's a gradual process. Uh, we're talking about millions of years um, and what I like about this is Everybody always talks about, or, or, they, or they have been, uh, we're trying not to use that anymore, the missing link. There is no such thing as a missing link unless you've lost one from your watch band. There's no such thing as a missing link. It's a continuum from Eusinopteron to in the lower Carboniferous Pederpes. Uh, and you can see each stage. Uh, Tiktaalik was a great find because it showed the progression from an earlier fish. Now we've got a neck. Thing still in the water, still in the water, still fishy. And then we get on to the uh, four or five 
uh, tetrapods uh, that we have. Um, so um, yeah, we don't, uh, and, and I, I, I particularly just don't like the term missing link at all. It just, it doesn't, it doesn't help. It doesn't describe anything. Uh, so, uh, but you can see that there's a continuum between uh, the fishies and the uh, uh, lower carboniferous amphibians. Can you go back to that slide where it showed the um, the two bottlenecks in the the extinctions, the two extinction events? Yep. So, can you see you it there? See it on, yeah, I can see it on the, on the the right. You can see those clear bottlenecks. But if you look yep. over to the far left, you don't see any. No. So what could explain that? Why there was not a similar impact? Well, there was. What you're looking at here is the individual um, orders of aminoids, goniotites, chlamydia, uh, agoniotites, and these guys which don't enter into it at all. These are separate uh, uh, distribution, uh, not distribution, um, uh, oh, what's the word I'm trying to think of? Um, this shows their um, number of species, genera, et cetera. Okay. Now, put all of these together, put all of those together and you get this spindle diagram. This represents all of these guys. Oh, well, okay. put them all together, and here is the agoniotites and the goniotites. All of a sudden, the agoniotites are gone. Yeah, I, I was missing that. That was what I was missing when I when you uh, were reviewing that. I was. I should, I should probably have a title here. These are these are what we call spindle diagrams, and spindle diagrams have the uh, uh, the diversity. That's the word I'm looking for. The diversity of everything combined. These have the diversity of the individual uh, orders. And we do that all the time for many different animals, not just cephalopods, but a lot of different animals they do that for. So this represents everything taken together. So the extinction of one group, uh, one order is actually shown. Uh, and you. here's these guys, yeah. Yeah, sure. I was I was reading that incorrectly, and it's because I don't want to pull the screen right up to my face and have you guys see me, you know. Um, but, okay. spindle, it's, spindle diagrams are not they're they're common in in uh, in professional uh, papers, but not so much. But um, these these really show uh, how they uh, and, and you can see also here here's the goniotites. They lost some diversity too. Mm -hmm. you see here, so you've lost all these, and you've lost these two arms here of the goniotites, and that's reflected here. And then, as these explode and these uh, come out, uh, the spindle diagram gets larger. And you can see how how wide the, these these may have been these may have been short lived and and fairly rare, but they were fairly diverse. Uh, they came out and just spread out. And then for some reason, uh, and they try to pin it on the, on the dorsal siphuncle. I don't think they have much to do with it. Uh, but all of a sudden, bam, they're gone. And you can see that's a, that's a large diversity missing. Here, they, here it is. Yep. You can see how much there is. There it's not. So, so yeah, these are all spin Go ahead. You said both of those events were two cycle events. Now, is that common or is that unusual to have a two cycle? And what would cause the the two cycles, and how far apart? No, are they? yeah, no, that's, that's not unusual. The uh, the end Ordovician extinction was uh, kind of a two part one. Also, um, the Permian one was one two parts, but they were pretty much separated in time. But they were still essentially part of the same extinction. It's not unusual at all. It's just that for the Devonian, these two for both the Kalwasser and Hangerbird, they occurred so close together that you've got to have a good uh, shale um, um, outcrops uh, to show them. Uh, so you have to have an extensive, and, and, that, and that occurs uh, mainly in, uh, in Germany 
even in, in the upstate New York, uh, those shales are from the Javedian, which is down here before all of this, these extinctions. So pretty much everything you see, not, not, not everything you can find up in, in but, but most of the stuff you see in upstate New York is from the Javedian um, uh, stage. And again, like I said, if you get a chance, upstate New York, north of Ithaca on the west side of the, uh, of the lake, um, and you go up to Taganic Falls, it's a famous park up there. You park, it's a mile in, but boy, is it easy walking. I could probably even do it with my knees as bad as they are. Um, and you'll get to the falls and who knows what you might see. Uh, we've seen everything from, like I said, my daughter and I saw a river otter. We've seen millipedes. Uh, we've seen lots of stuff there. It's an enjoyable afternoon or morning afternoon walk. It's as, as Carl Sagan said, it provides an agreeable break in the routine of the day. That's my Carl Sagan. Hey, John. John. Do you huh? think that um, the need to uh, climb out on the land or out of the water to gulp oxygen was partly due to the fact that the oxygen content in the water was decreasing? Oh, probably. If, uh, they, were, they were developing. See, the, the, the drying up of the pools did have something to do with it. Uh, drying pools are not good for oxygen. Uh, you you lose the oxygen. Remember, remember, we're talking about dissolved oxygen uh, in these in these things. And certainly, uh, that was uh, the impetus for getting the uh, oxygen in gulping air, mm -hmm. not the not the uh, impetus for going out. Uh, and and like like we, we said, they used to say about eusinopteron, it's it's not going to crawl to to other uh, ponds. Not going to do that. But it is going to start gulping air, and certainly. Uh, if the pools dried up, the fish in there are they're gonna die. Yeah. As simple as that. They're 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 gonna go belly up. Uh, but the bigger pools, uh, the animals survived, they started gulping air, and then it just led to the fact that, well, I need to, I need in 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 now it's a little bit wetter, the pools are a little deeper. I've got to I've got to hold myself up to gulp my air. And that's where your uh, pectoral fins start to be developed. And you can see in all of the restorations, they show the pectoral fins as being the vertical oriented, strong limbs. Uh, the pelvic fins- I thought of those animals uh, that died in the actual uh, dried up pools themselves, indicating maybe there was a lot of CO2 down there instead of- No, oxygen. no, they just, the pool just dried up oh. and the animals, just like, just like you see, you know, uh, animals today that uh, when a pool dries up, uh, a lot of times the fish and the frogs dry up and you get, essentially you get uh, um, dead cadavers and carcasses and stuff, which is, you know, neat. Anywho. John, yes, John, two questions about that slide you have there. Right here. I'm yeah. sure the first, or actually first one, the scale there says genera. Mm -hmm. So doesn't that mean number of genus rather than orders, or does that really matter? Yeah, it's they put that in there to show why this is thin, this is thick, you know, uh, that this is 20 genera. So here, uh, the early uh, uh, goniotites represent uh, three or four genera. Um, and in fact, as you can see here, these guys starting out uh, started out with over twenty genera, uh, and and they and no no I get that I get that. Okay, but does that mean orders? So were there no, sixty orders of those no, no, Goniatidia no, no, no. or sixty no, no. genus? Sixty genera. So these what does that are, genera mean then? Uh, um. Homo sapiens, Homo sapiens, Homo is a genus. So it is uh, genus then. Okay, you said orders before. Oh yeah, these these are the orders. Okay. Now in the order, 
in for example here's the goniotite so the the most common no, but the type. scale below that right says that width represents 20 genera this represents so that would be about 60 genera um 20 uh 40 50, within uh, isn't that in within the order goniotidia that's within each order yes this, okay this, then i understand this, that and okay, that's how many one, genera in there yes and this rep this this scale is for each of these diagrams here. I get it now. I get it now. This scale is for this uh, diagram here, the spindle diagram. Yep, I get it. A second okay. question. Yep. And I'm sure you've I'm sure you've described this before, so I apologize for asking the question again. Not at all. What What's the difference between an aminoid and an mm -hmm. ammonite? Okay. Uh, there's three major groups of cephalopods, nautiloids, aminoids, coleoids. Uh, coleoids are the soft ones, the octopods, uh, squid, et cetera, decapods. Uh, aminoids are, are, are gone, and then the nautiloids. Now, in the aminoids, the OID is a, is a general term that means everything in this group. So nautiloid is everything in the nautiloid group, even though there were two major groups. In the aminoids, there were three, well, okay. There were four major uh, groups based on uh, their sutures. The simple ones, the real simple ones that were almost like nautiloids was the agoniotites. Then there was the goniotite sutures, which are a little bit more uh, uh, involved, you know, moving. Uh, we're talking about lobes and saddles. Then came, as you saw in that one diagram, let me see if I can get it real quickly for us. There it is. Uh, crap. I don't know if you, can you see it? Here's the, yeah, here's the serotites. Yep. The serotites had crenulated, oh, just I think they're I think they were crenulated lobes, but very simple saddles. Lobes are bends um, towards the aperture, and saddles are bends away from the apertures. Okay, these guys had crenulated um, uh, lobes, but not saddles. Then came and they're still, as far as I know, they're still not certain how they went from these guys to the true ammonites. The true ammonites popped up in the Jurassic, and they had those, and you've seen them on fossils, those incredibly crenulated sutures on both the lobes and the saddles. They look like, I mean, they look like uh, electrocardiograms. They look like um, seismic uh, things. They're just up and down and all over the place. Well, since they called them the ammonite sutures, uh, then the animals are called the ammonites. So mm. all ammonites are ammonoids, but not all ammonoids are ammonites. Ammonites right. are only those that occurred in the Jurassic and Cretaceous. And again, they're still not, as far as I know, and, and obviously I read a lot of this, how the ammonites, and there, was a, there was an extinction at the end of the Triassic. It was, it, it, it decimated both uh, both groups of uh, cephalopods. It's probably about the only one that was the same. Um, the nautiloids were down to two uh, genera, one coiled and one straight. And the ammonoids, these guys stop. And then in the Jurassic, the ammonites start. How? Don't know. But they do have the true ammonite sutures. So uh, basically, Ammonites are specific types of aminoids. Okay, cool. Based on again, based on the sutures you see on the shell. Uh, in fact, awesome. there's one right there that has you can see the the crenulations. Yep. On them. Uh, you can see that. I mean, they're really and and something like I don't know you've seen you've probably seen Placentisaurus from the uh, upper uh, Cretaceous out west, 
those things, I mean, those sutures are wow. Uh, they're really crenulated and, and, and um, they've been working on why did they do that for oh, 100, 150 years. And, uh, and, and you've seen in my programs, I, my uh, idea is that they were used, the, the more surface area was easier to bring fluid in and out so that they could adjust their, uh, when they lost gel uh, from attacks, uh, they were able to adjust their uh, buoyancy faster than nautiloids could, but that's my idea. See, get me started on cephalopods. <laughs> yes, yes, that's, that's your fault, guys. Come on. Well, I did. I did describe you as the resident uh, molluscan expert on the website this past Friday. Well, at least for nautiloids, yeah. But I saw that, and I appreciate that. Thank you very much, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned the one um and i'm gonna i'm not even gonna the c y c l y m a n i i d yeah these guys right here yeah you said that there was something very different about their stuff in yeah they had oh gosh can i i would have to get a different um i would have to get a different um PowerPoint up, and that would be, I, I, and I would not know how to do it. I'd screw everything up. But most you can change files here if you want to, and not get out of sharing. Sure. Uh huh. If you know what one it is. Uh huh. Okay, here's that one I just showed you. Right here. Okay. Can you see this central part right here? Mm hmm That's and that's why I, that's why I got this one. That's the siphuncle exposed. Every aminoid has the siphuncle. Now watch me turn it. Now watch me turn it. See, there's the siphuncle. There. It's on the venter. That's the venter of the animal. This animal lived like this. Okay. Every, no every aminoid has that, except that group, the chlamydia. They would have their siphuncles right here inside. on the other side. The in essentially, you're talking about the outside outside of the curve for most, and they had it on the inside of the curve. Now, that said, there were coil and curved nautiloids that had a dorsal siphuncle, and they were very successful. No problem whatsoever. So why these guys, well, first of all, why they developed the dorsal siphuncle, nobody knows. And in fact, it was <clears throat> generally speaking, on average, larger than the siphuncles of the other aminoids at the same time, the uh, goniotites, et cetera. Okay. I, again, why they did that, nobody knows. They lived, had a short lifespan. And it's easy to say, well, yeah, you know, they were bucking the system. They had a dorsal siphuncle. Well, they're going to die out. Really? Why? You yeah. see, it, it, uh, it, there's, something, there's something in coils, coiled cephalopods with siphuncles have something called coupling and decoupling. Okay. Coupling is when you have the uh, fluid inside new step, uh, new chambers, uh, and, and older ones too, in contact with the siphuncle. Oh, it's real easy to get rid of that. It just osmosis just pulls it out. But in the curve, there's going to come a time when you're going to be uncoupled, where the fluid is going to be here, the siphuncle is over there. And that's when they rely, as does Nautilus, on an internal um, um, uh, fleshy stuff uh, uh, called the pellicle that brings the uh, water, uh, liquid over to the siphon. Okay. Well, if you have a dorsal siphuncle, actually, you're going to be decoupled less than a ventral siphuncle. So, you know, say what you will about these guys. 
I don't think that the dorsal siphuncle had anything to do with their demise. Why they were, you can see this, they were really pretty successful, short period of time, and then they didn't just taper off, they just, bam, died off. Why? Yeah. That's a rhetorical question because I can't answer it. So there. I don't think anybody can answer it. I've got, and I've got I've got three or four, uh, five, uh, pretty pretty uh, detailed uh, papers on on those guys, and they have no idea why they did, died out. Did any of them have a central? No. 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 Nope. Okay. Even Baculites, um, the weird one, uh, has. Uh, um, you know, the, the straight, the straight shell, essentially straight shell. This not it, when it was first when it first hatches, it's coiled, but uh, has a, a siphon at one side, uh, not in the center. They, none of them had it at the center. Um, okay, I got to show you. I've got to send you these pictures of a fossil I found where it's in the center, and I'm really very confused by it. Remember, there were nautiloids all through every 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 place there was an ammonoid there's going to be a nautiloid because they were there before the ammonoids. And as I really enjoy telling everybody, they were there and still are after the ammonoids. Huh. Okay. Yes, but send me any pictures you want <clears throat> and I'll look at them. I just had somebody from uh, Door County uh, sent me a, uh, uh, some pictures. I don't. Know, I think it was at a, a museum or something uh, of uh, uh, three cephalopods that he had, and uh, essentially they weren't. They were just the siphuncles, uh, which I told him, and they were, uh, from what I could tell, they were three different genera of uh, of nautiloids. Uh, uh, each of them were different. So, yeah, send me any pictures you want. Okay. I like uh, pictures. John, at this point, I'm going to stop recording. Okay. And I'll open up the talk. If we have more questions about the Devonian or Siphuncles, please or continue. Anything. <laughs>